Hey guys, it's me, the Animation Connoisseur. If you've been following my channel for a while now, you may remember that I planned to release this video several months ago, but was unable to due to copyright issues with Disney. I was very heartbroken about that happening because I spent so much time working on this video since I care about this film so much. I did end up publishing the audio on YouTube, but that failed to gain the same amount of attention that my previous review, Why Cars is Pixar's Magnum Opus, had, which was extremely disheartening for me. After having some time to think, I decided to give it another shot. But since I had deleted the previous files I used in my initial draft, I had to replace them all. Which was a lot of work. Also, you may notice that there is a giant Disney logo over the clips from the film I used. That's normal. I added that as a way to get around the copyright claims. I know, it's a bit distracting, but at least it's better than looking at absolutely nothing, right? Anyway, without further ado, enjoy the video. When it comes to asking someone what the best Disney film is, you're bound to get a variety of responses. Some say that The Lion King is the best movie the studio created. Others claim that it's The Hunchback of Notre Dame or Mulan. Still others argue that Beauty and the Beast is their magnum opus, or Aladdin, or even Bambi. But to me, no film the studio has put out comes close to that of Meet the Robinsons. Meet the Robinsons is truly one of the most underrated gems of our time. When it first opened to the public on March 30th, 2007, it was met with a rather lukewarm reception. To critics and audiences at the time, it was a forgettable movie that was inferior to the studio's other, more popular outputs. Almost as quickly as it was revealed, it was forgotten. Soon after the arrival of Disney's later CGI films, it seemed to have become a lost relic entirely. But over the years, the movie began to gain traction through a cult following. While its popularity among fans of Disney's more obscure properties never quite reached the heights of other movies like Treasure Planet or Atlantis The Lost Empire, it still held a sizable audience captive with its imaginative and touching storytelling, as well as its witty humor. Thanks to their efforts, after nearly a decade since its release, Disney has finally begun to take notice of their own creation once again, with them even going so far as to actively promote it in advertisements for their streaming service, Disney+. Plus. Now that this film has become more popular nowadays, I think it's the perfect time to take a look at why this film is an underrated masterpiece. In the early 2000s, Disney was struggling to stay relevant among the current landscape of animation. Many of their traditionally animated films at the time were performing very poorly at the box office, failing to recoup the large budgets they'd been given. All the while, DreamWorks and Pixar's CGI animated flicks had been given widespread acclaim, raking in millions of dollars both nationally and abroad. From Disney's point of view, audiences didn't seem to be interested in the traditions of old any longer. So, to appeal to their more modern audience, they decided to make a radical change. Abandoning 2D animation, the very thing they had built their legacy on, to take a gamble on CGI. Their first fully-fledged computer-animated film was Chicken Little, a reimagining of the classic fable complete with a suburban setting and full-on alien invasion. Unfortunately, the movie failed to capture the hearts and minds of audiences in the way their previous works had, and was panned by critics almost all across the board. The planned sequel for the movie, Chicken Little 2 Mission to Mars, was cancelled after its poor reception, and soon after this bitter failure, the studio began to shift their priorities. Bob Iger, Disney's chairman and CEO, realized what an asset Pixar Animation Studios had been to the Walt Disney Company. Throughout their partnership, Pixar had brought Disney great wealth, prosperity, and interest through their films and characters. In his mind, trying to compete against them after all the good they'd done for the studio was folly. For Disney to truly be successful in the future, we had to return to the glory days of animation. So I began focusing on how to do that, and it really begins with finding the right people. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that Pixar had more of the right people than probably any other uh, place in the world from an animation perspective. I then went to the opening of Hong Kong Disneyland in September, and the parade went by. It hit me that the characters that were in the parade all came from films that had been made prior to the mid-90s, except for some of the Pixar characters. I felt that I needed to think even more out of the box than I had been thinking, and uh, I had a much greater sense of urgency. I became CEO October 1st. I called Steve around that time, 
and said I thought we ought to talk. I had some bigger ideas. And that began a long period of discussion because it was very serious for both sides. He knew he couldn't afford to let such talent get away from them, so he put an end to the long-standing negotiations feud between the two studios, and in a stunning move, bought out the then Burgoyaning Pixar for a whopping $7.4 billion. As part of the deal, John Lasseter, one of the main founders and key members of Pixar Animation, was appointed CEO of his company and given direct creative control at Disney as the CCO of Walt Disney Feature Animation. With Lasseter in charge, Disney finally had a clear vision for their projects. Quality was placed over quantity, with the goal in mind to create great films that could truly wow audiences, as the studio had done before in years past. Around this time, Disney had acquired the rights to William Joyce's children's story, A Day with Wilbur Robinson. Initially, the film was pitched as being live action, but the studio decided to change its format. Now it was just a matter of finding a director. Stephen J. Anderson, a longtime storyboard artist and assistant animator at Disney Animation, came across the script for the film and immediately connected to it. My story is similar to Lewis's in that uh, I was adopted. I was not in an orphanage uh, like Lewis. Some of our s the specifics of our stories were different, but um, the questions that he was asking himself throughout the story, where did I come from, who's my birth mother, why did she give me up, these are the same questions that I'd asked ever since I can remember. So that character was really the thing that, that I responded to and said, I have to tell this story. I understand how this kid thinks. I handcuffed myself to that script and I said, this is mine, I gotta got do this, I gotta tell this story. When making the movie, the team working on it was given the unique challenge of storyboarding the entire film A to Z before it was greenlit. This was done by the studio to test whether or not it would be worth making. When presented with the original drafts of the film, Lasseter's initial impressions were less than stellar. He felt the film's main antagonist, the bowler hat guy, wasn't a threatening character and suggested some changes to Anderson that he felt needed to be made. Under his watch, nearly 60% of the movie was retooled, with the additions of Doris as a new antagonist, the dinosaur chase sequence, and a rewritten ending for the film. While Lasseter may have had a big hand in the development of Robinson's, ultimately it was Steven Anderson's connection to the characters and the passion he possessed for it that got the film across the finish line. Whenever I ask someone who their favorite character from Robinson's is, it's very rare that I ever hear them say that it's Lewis. Most of the time, people seem to gravitate towards either Goob or Wilbur, and barely acknowledge Lewis at all. While I do hold a lot of love towards those characters as well, I think it's an absolute injustice that Lewis hardly receives any praise himself, as he's a far deeper character than one might think. What makes him stand out among most typical Disney protagonists is that he is far from being a pure, perfect paragon. He fails, he screws up, he makes mistakes, which is what makes him a human character. Lewis has had a very tough road to hoe. He was abandoned by his mother on the doorstep of an orphanage when he was just a baby, and since then he's constantly been rejected for adoption. He invents, performs, and longs to be chosen by a potential family but the revolving door of opportunity always seems to end up being slammed in his face, with his hopes, dreams, and heart being abandoned on that same doorstep once again, in a seemingly never-ending cycle. But over the course of the film, he soon begins to realize the truth. As he spends more and more time with the Robinsons, he comes to understand that living in the past won't give him the life that he wants to have, but rather that he already has the life he desires with them. When he's finally given the opportunity he's always dreamed of, to go back in time and convince his mother to keep him, he relents. As much as it pains him to do so, as much as he loves her and misses her, he realizes that he has to let his past go so that he may embrace his future. He knows that even if he gains her back, he'll lose so much more in return. And so, he walks away but not before making sure that the events of his life play out as they're supposed to. This is what makes Lewis such an inspirational character. Even though he was constantly thrown challenge after challenge by life, and nearly came close to giving in and giving up on several occasions, in the end he never did. He kept moving forward, and ultimately, his perseverance allowed him to overcome his inner demons and achieve the life that he always wanted to have. 
even if it wasn't quite what he expected. In letting go, not only was he able to free himself, but he ended up with more than he could ever have dreamed to have as a result. Some critics of Meet the Robinsons find its large family cast to be a bit excessive. They claim they're underdeveloped characters and don't add anything of value to the story. While there is a kernel of truth to their former statement, as not all of them are super fleshed out, it is completely untrue that they contribute nothing to the plot. Through their zany antics and inventions, Lewis's eyes are open to the wonder of possibility. Their acceptance and celebration of his failures helps him begin to feel secure in his identity, and encourages him to continue generating hope and inspiration for others through his creations. While the majority of the Robinson family plays a smaller role than Wilbur, Franny, Carl, and Bud, that does not make it any less of an important one. What makes them such a crucial piece of the puzzle is that they serve as a symbol for the freedom that Lewis needs in his life. The reason they are portrayed in such a zany and erratic manner is to show that they are confident in themselves and their identities, and aren't weighed down by the expectations of the world or the judgments of others. They're free to do um, anything that makes them happy. What makes you happy is what you need to pursue in, in your life. It doesn't matter if it's weird. If you want to build a spaceship and deliver pizzas throughout the galaxy, do it. Ding dong, pizza's here. And the Robinsons then, that really became their philosophy. They had to become a positive uh, group of people. And it all kind of stems from the matriarch and the patriarch of the family, grandma and grandpa. As bizarre as the Robinsons get, at the core, there's still a family like like your family, like my family, like everybody's family. Their unwavering love towards Lewis is what allows him to see how much he truly matters, which gives him the confidence he needed in himself to become the person he was always destined to be. Through Franny, he comes to experience both the motherly love he missed in his life, and later on, find relational love with another. Through Bud, he is given acceptance for who he is and cherished for his accomplishments as he was the first one to celebrate in his failure. And through Cornelius, he's able to open his eyes to the true life he's called to live, which is what ultimately sways him into letting his mother go. Arguably most important of all, however, is the impact Wilbur has on his life. Because if it weren't for his actions, Lewis never would have had any of the relationships I just mentioned, and may very well have stayed stuck in the past forever without his son to show him the way. But beyond all that, most incredibly of all, he was willing to risk his existence, and his entire family's existence for that matter, so Lewis could reunite with his mom, just because he loved him that much. When Lewis rejects his offer, naturally he's stunned. He knew how much Lewis desired to be reunited with her, and couldn't comprehend why he'd let her go. But what he failed to understand in that moment is that he had shown Lewis he had something far greater to receive. And when the two boys embrace, he remarks something truly special. I never thought my dad would be my best friend. This is why Wilbur's role in the story is so pivotal towards Lewis's growth. Not only is he the catalyst for all the change that his father undergoes throughout the story, but he also serves as the true friend that Lewis needed in his life. Mike Gubian is simultaneously one of the most cleverly written, hilarious, and sympathetic characters ever put to screen. It's incredible how the filmmakers managed to make such a seemingly goofy character into an extremely multifaceted one as well. He starts out simple enough, just another kid in the orphanage with a dry sense of humor and a dream to someday win a baseball game. At first glance, he's seemingly just another background character, but is soon revealed to have been the one behind it all. What makes that reveal so incredible is that unlike most twist villain reveals these days, it is actually unexpected. Why? Because the personalities of young Goob and adult Goob are so distinct. One has a more cynical, I don't give a crap attitude, while the other is a complete and utter man-child seeking petty revenge on Lewis. I know when I watched the movie for the first time, I never suspected that the two were the same person until the adult Goob outright admitted it. But what makes the twist even better is the fact that it's not a radical shift in his character. Given the circumstance of his situation, it's very understandable why his attitude changed over the years. 
While his behavior is mostly played for laughs and makes for quite hilarious slapstick comedy, in truth, it is a tragic sight to behold. Goob thinks that he's doing the right thing by getting back at Lewis for ruining his life, but in reality, he's only making it worse for himself. His inability to take responsibility for his own life and emotional instability are what make him such a tragic character. You see the potential that he possesses to be better than he is now, which makes it so hard not to feel for him. In many ways, Goob serves as a mirror to Lewis. He exemplifies what Lewis could have become if he chose to stay stuck in the past and refuse to move forward. The circumstances of their grief may be different, but the central theme remains the same. They both have had to deal with rejection and derision from others in their own lives, taking an extreme toll on their hearts and minds. But while Lewis is able to take the high road and put the past behind him, Goob can't let it go. At least, not until Lewis wakes him up by showing him how his actions indirectly destroy civilization. Despite all that he's done, Lewis still knows that deep down, Goob is a good person who was just being taken advantage of by another. This is why he wants him to have another chance. But Goob, having realized the impact of all that he's done, feels ashamed and unworthy to become part of the Robinson family, and walks away. His journey ends on a rather philosophical note, as in the journal he left behind, Lewis and Wilbur see he jotted down a question mark, signifying his incertitude in what to do with his life now that he's reached the end of his bitterness. Even so, Lewis was determined not to give up on him. If he couldn't help him in the future, then he'd do so in the past, and in so doing, set him on a better path. Door 15, or Doris as she's referred to in the film, is an equally brilliant antagonist. Doris is by far one of my favorite Disney villains because just like Lewis, she completely breaks the mold of her character type. Disney's villains over the years haven't always made for the greatest of characters. There are many exceptions, of course, but there are also plenty of others who are overconfident, egotistic, and full of themselves. They often gloat about how great they are, primarily in song form, and how they're the ones who'll bring down the heroes of their story single-handedly, but when it comes right down to it, they don't have the skills, cunning, or mind to back it up. Which is what leads to their inevitable downfall. But with Doris, this is far from the case. Doris doesn't brag about her plans or how great she is because she knows that would just be a waste of time. After all, actions speak far louder than words. That aspect of her character is a big reason why she's so unique. She communicates entirely through use of pantomime, but her motivations are still understandable to the audience. While she appears to be nothing more than a sidekick to Goob at first, soon it becomes crystal clear that she is the one in the driver's seat of the relationship. And once he ceases to be valuable to her cause, she disposes of Goob in one of the most sadistic and brutal ways possible having him ripped apart by her minions. Should anyone stand in her way of achieving what she perceives as her true purpose, she'll remove them through any means necessary. She's nothing short of pure evil, devoid of any scruples or standards, and seeking only to dominate and conquer others. What truly makes her stand out among the rest of Disney's villains is the fact that unlike most of their antagonists, she actually succeeds in her plan and manages to rule over the entire world for several years. The time travel element of the movie makes it seem like she only retains her power for a few minutes, but since the film's main time stream is suggested to be set in the same year as Robinson's release, whereas the future takes place 30 years later, that would mean that humanity would have had to endure her tyranny for roughly three decades before Lewis fixed the timeline. Even though in the end she is defeated, her death is truly a sight to behold. With seven little words, Lewis erases her from the fabric of reality entirely as she breaks down and disappears into thin air, making for an extremely satisfying scene. Not only is it beautiful from the standpoint of Lewis triumphantly exercising his newly gained self-confidence over her, but from a visual standpoint as well, it truly gives you the sense that he's bested his demons and become a better person for it in the process. I've talked a little bit about this throughout the video, 
Bamitha Robinson's sense of humor is one of the main aspects of the film that makes it such a masterpiece. As I mentioned before, the reason that it's a bit bizarre is because it's meant to emphasize the whole main idea of being true to who you are and not weighed down by negative influence. It's one of the very few instances where humor not only complements the plot of a film, but adds to it as well. It is genuinely comedic brilliance. Sometimes there's just a random one-liner where a character will say something really witty, or a side gag that adds something clever or heartwarming to a scene. Just take a look at some of this stuff and you'll see what I mean. Five years ago, Dad wakes up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat, wants to build a time machine. So he starts working. We're talking plans. We're talking scale models. We're talking prototypes. That's a prototype? The very first. Or what's left of it. Yikes. Yeah. Dark day at the Robinson house. Children, please. Your mother is trying to take a nap. What is all the yelling out here? She started it. I don't want to hear anymore. Now, sweetie. Don't you, sweetie me. I'm going for a drive! That's strange. She usually takes the Harley. Who dares to disturb my sanctuary? Carl, it's me. Let me in. None may enter unless they speak the royal password. Carl, what are you talking about? We don't have a password. Yes, we do. I made one up while you were gone. Then how am I supposed to know what it is? You... Good point. I have a lot of respect towards the filmmakers for integrating the humor into the film in a way that made sense, because that's not something you can really say about a lot of movies these days. Meet the Robinson soundtrack is one of the finest pieces of music I have ever had the pleasure of listening to. Its songs are so astounding that like with Cars' soundtrack, it deserves a video of its own, but I'll still give it a passing mention here. When making Robinson's, Steven Anderson knew the music needed to reflect both the upbeat and emotional aspects of the film. To achieve this, he enlisted the help of one of the most talented musicians in the business, Danny Elfman. Elfman was responsible for composing the instrumental sections of the score, as well as a majority of the lyrical portions. But he never performed any of those himself. Rather, Rufus Wainwright, Rob Thomas, Jamie Colum, and the All-American Rejects were the ones who handled that. Each of these artists contributed to the story in unique but equally special ways. Rufus Wainwright emphasized Lewis's desire to be accepted and find where he belonged in his song Another Believer. Rob Thomas demonstrated what he had learned and how far he had come in Little Wonders. The All-American Rejects added a sense of optimism and excitement to the future with their upbeat tune the future has arrived, and Jamie Colum gave the movie a dose of class and a touch of whimsy with his performances of Give Me the Simple Life and Where Is Your Heart At. Arguably the greatest song to come out of its soundtrack, however, is Rob Thomas's Little Wonders. Like any great ending theme for a film, it manages to encapsulate the main idea that makes it so special in a beautiful, poetic way, without feeling ham-handed or forced. It proves that you don't have to allow the past to define who you are, and can instead choose to live for today, not taking for granted any of life's small, but defining moments. Funnily enough, when Thomas first began writing the song, he didn't even know what the theme of the film was about. I was walking my dog, actually, and it was like one of these moments where I couldn't get him to move, and I'm you know, trying to get him to go, and he looks up and, he, and he's, I, I look over and he's sitting there in the wind just like smiling. You know, he won't move because he was just like feeling the wind. And I had, and it just all kind of hit me in one minute. I like that, you know, that this is what everything's about. These small hours and these moments. And then it all just started to kind of flow together. It's a message resonates with me personally because it's something that I've had to learn in my own life. Meet the Robinsons is a film that has been a part of my life for many years. But unlike most of my favorite animated films, it wasn't one I grew up on. I knew of its existence thanks to the trailer I saw on my Cars DVD, but it wasn't until I was around 9 years old that I was able to actually see it. After my mom brought to my attention that it was airing on the Disney Channel, I decided to tune in to watch, and I quickly fell in love with it. I gravitated towards Lewis's character in particular. Even though I was fortunate enough to have been raised by my biological parents, like him, I too had made many mistakes in my life and struggled to move forward from my own challenges. 
On top of that, at times I had been pushed away and ridiculed by others for things that I liked, did, or said. When I moved away from home, my connection to it grew even stronger. I was in a situation where I felt so alone, confused, and upset, just as Lewis did. I wanted nothing more than to escape from my current reality and return to the past. I tried searching for places or people that would be exactly like the ones I had before in an attempt to cling on to a piece of what I once possessed. But over time, as I realized that it was all in vain, I quickly became depressed and disillusioned. I closed myself off from everything and everyone and developed a cynical and bitter attitude towards life. Eventually though, I came to a place where I was able to break free from that and begin to see things more clearly. I remembered Lewis and Goob's mutual struggle to let go of the past and how it had different outcomes for them both. They both had to cope with the same kind of pain, but only one of them was able to see the good in it before it was too late. Much as I hated my situation, I knew that if I stayed stuck in my state of anguish, it would destroy me as it did Goob. So instead, I decided to follow Lewis's example and keep moving forward. In the end, it paid off, and I became a much happier and healthier person. So whenever I watch Robinson's, I'm always reminded of that, and thankful for the hope it gave me in that turbulent time. There are so many moments and details in this film that give it a sense of character and add weight to the plot. For example, in the opening of the movie, if you listen closely at the moment just before Lewis's mother drops him off on the doorstep, you can hear the sound of a person almost slipping in the rain. At first you don't think much of this because not much attention is drawn towards it, but then when Lewis goes back and sees his mother in that point in time, it's revealed that as he walks away from her, he accidentally makes that sound. It's such a subtle detail, but it goes a long way towards establishing continuity in the story. Another example is the montage of Lewis's lab expanding and becoming filled with all his various sketches and inventions right before the end credits of the film. If you look closely, you can see some prototypes of Carl lying around that Lewis is working on so he can fulfill his promise about remembering to invent him. As a side note, in the flashback sequence where Doris is shown being placed into storage, if you look closely in the surrounding containment units, you can see several characters from Disney's scrap films My Peoples and Wildlife. It's a clever little detail that in a way serves as a metaphor for how sometimes things may not turn out the way you planned, but being open to change can lead you to bigger and better ones on the horizon. Arguably the most important details of the film, though, are the ones that surround the relationship between Lewis and his mother. When tackling the idea of providing Lewis with closure towards his mom and his abandonment, Anderson initially struggled with how to bring that concept to life. Originally, he had the idea that rather than have Lewis reveal Lucille's lost memory through his invention, instead he would follow through on his original intention of using it to display a memory of his mother from his own past, but would shut the machine off before her face could be revealed. Despite being almost fully animated, the scene was ultimately dropped from the film because it wasn't a strong enough conclusion to Lewis's arc. Eventually, the idea came up to have Lewis reunite with his mom through time travel. One of the suggestions that frequently came with it was that Lewis should learn something by going into the past. But Anderson adamantly rejected the idea, because he knew that if Lewis did end up learning something from the past, it would undermine the message of the film. A lot of the notes we'd get from people would say that they wanted Lewis to get something out of it, either be it on the memory scanner or in this moment where he's actually uh, right behind his mom. People said, oh, I want, him to, I want him to see something or I want him to hear something or I want him to, to get some kind of information from this moment, to have some kind of closure on this moment. I really disagreed with that. To me, to make the purest thematic statement, uh, you can't find any answers in the past. If the movie is about let go of the past and keep moving forward, uh, the past should lead to dead ends. If you spent all your time, if you got your time machine and you went to the past and you spent, and you searched and searched and searched for the answers that you're looking for in the past, you should come up empty-handed every single time. 
you know, if Lewis had gone to the past and got some kind of closure, found out some kind of information, got to see his mom's face, whatever it may be, and also then got this great future, to me that's not dramatic. It was important that you got to choose. You choose between past or you choose between future. If you choose the past, that's where you are, and that's that was the choice. You don't get a good future. If you choose the future, the past goes away. You can't have both. In the end, it proved to be the right decision, and gave Lewis's character arc the best conclusion it could have. Looking back on the experience of writing their relationship, Anderson himself has admitted that he doesn't even have an idea of what Lewis's mother would have looked like. I mean, a lot of people would say, well, do you know who his mom is, or do you know what she looks like? Or, and I, my answer was always, well, if Lewis decided he didn't need to know, then I don't need to know, so I really don't know who she mm -hmm. would be. And, um, so I don't really have an answer for that. It just goes to show how much Anderson cared about getting the story right and making sure that it didn't contradict itself in any way. And for his dedication in that area of storytelling, he truly holds my respect. Meet the Robinses is an underrated gem of a film that deserves far more love and admiration than it often receives. It's a movie filled with love, warmth, heart, the gift of possibility, and humor. All these qualities make Disney's film some of the most memorable to exist. This was a passion project that could only have been made by someone who possessed a deep connection and love for its story and characters, which is apparent in every aspect of its development. But beyond all that, this film is important for one very special reason. Its message embodies the heart and soul of the man who built the company it was produced by. Through the stories and characters he created, Walt Disney helped unite families of all backgrounds with the power of imagination. Walt too was a man who faced many trials and tribulations in his life, but he never gave up. Just like Lewis, he kept moving forward, opening up new doors and trying new things, which kept leading him down new paths. It is tragic that his own studio has veered so far from his original vision in recent years, but films like these are reminders of why he'll always be remembered in our hearts.